Yes. Especially so, so the notion of the apple of uh, Exactly, it's not that, positive. Uh, chaos sets in vertically, and in large complex systems, you have a of chaos at the apple of exponents, which you might want to diagonalize. And then uh, you might find, just because our description of nature is not perfect, we can't understand the million times, million times, million degrees of freedom without making approximations. Uh, what are the smartest approximations to make? And uh, one of our examples is when you do Photoshop. You may rotate a photo by any angle you like, and you get a remarkably sharp picture rotated up over any number of degrees. Whereas you know the pixel analysis is very strange. What happens pixel by pixel? But they've solved that problem, I think, as a fully analysis or something. There's a way of doing this, and, and all of us know how to do this. And, and they do a good job because I rotate the pictures all the time and I don't have a note any problems with the pictures. <laughs> so, um, and you're working through a, some kind of screen. Right. More so I think in cellular compound, same thing if, that rotation simply comes about by some mathematical procedure not allowed what you do with Photoshop when you rotate the picture. Mm -hmm. But I think nature does it in the smart way. They're looking at the rotation operators and then And uh, as soon as you do that, of course, you very often you introduce also swap operators. Well, I'm still not, forgive me, I'm still not understanding. This is ultimately a classical system. So how do you account for Bell and Paul? Correct. So that indeed is a very difficult question. And I'm asking this question myself all the time. Which basically, it has to do with some basic assumptions that Bell always makes. It is that a particle with a spin in x direction, spin in z direction, that they are somehow reality. That if someone observes a particle with a spin in one direction, they never question whether the observation was a real observation or not. And uh, for instance, uh, the whole argument the Bell's is working, but it was very different if you run the thing backwards in time. Nobody normally does that. But of course, in ordinary physics, we know that the equations for running forward in time are the same as the equations for running backwards in time. If you now take a Bell system, a Bell kind of experiment, and run backwards in time, you start with a, a, a entangled state, and you can propagate backwards in time. If it's not entangled, you, you, wrote, you propagate it backwards in time, you don't get your original state to start off with at all. You get some complete mixture of states. So, um, so the argument of Bell's inequality is very sensitive to uh, the assumption that your initial state was not entangled. Uh, somehow you start with something you knew, but actually you didn't. And there's other ingredient in Bell's inequalities which I always have been fighting against, which is the notion of free will. They say an, op uh, an observer at any moment has the free will to determine either the x component or the y component of the spin. This is obviously false. In a deterministic theory, you don't have such free will. You are, whatever you do is determined by, by your past. So you can't rotate the measurement device of spin without also affecting what happened in the past. Why and people always ignore that, and I think that's a big mistake. And why should mention that Bell was aware of that? So in a deterministic one? Bell was aware of that. In a deterministic one, Bell is an inequality, that doesn't make sense. But the strange thing, both Bell and many other people who do pump this today say, but that we don't believe. They say, Another we idea. don't believe in such a conspiracy. They think it's a conspiracy. Mm -hmm. But if you want to change what the observer does today, mm -hmm. you have to change its past. Mm -hmm. But you have to change the past in a very conspirational way. And nobody believes in conspiracies. It's a central way of saying I don't believe in deterministic. Well, but I mean, yeah, it is. But uh, can I just advocate, say a little bit about that? Because. This is what I describe my students when I teach them quantum mechanics as the demiurge theory. You know, in, in, Greek, in Greek philosophy, there's a notion of demiurge, who's this all powerful being, kind of like God, but not necessarily nice. You know? <laughs> and, and the demiurge is, in particular, the demiurge is fond of messing with people's heads. And so the demiurge can mess with your head to make you believe that you have free will. And they can certainly mess with your head when you're deciding which which angle to put your measurement apparatus in the Bell's inequality to make you believe that quantum mechanics is true. So, but, but, then, but, then, but then the question is, well, you know, 
why would the demiurge want it to make you believe that quantum mechanics is true if the world is actually classical? I mean, it's sort of bizarre. It's like we have this apparently classical decoherent world at this level. We go down to a lower, more microscopic level, the most microscopic we can get to. It looks like it's quantum mechanical. But then the claim is below there, there's some classical thing. Is the demiurge really so nasty as to try to, like, you know, convince us that the world is quantum mechanical? Why? I think the best answer the question can come up with now which is an answer I'm not totally happy with, so I agree it's an important problem, <coughs> is that you can construct models which are a little bit like the standard model using this technique. And the standard model itself, of course, allows people who, whose atoms behave according to the standard model to do bell kinds of experiments. And, of course, you have to copy the result on that. So if the standard quantum generates a Standard, if Sarah Otondon generates a standard model-like system, then people living in that standard model can do that experiment. And it's all quantum mechanics of that architect. So then I don't see any contradiction in that. But I still see the original Bell argument as a problem. But the problem is Bell then allows observer at the last moment to decide to switch his imperatives. And I say you can't do that without switching the past. So, in, so as a way, can I describe this as a kind of conspiracy theory? So, so the, the claim would then be, but the, tell me if I'm wrong about this, my description of what you said. So the world is, is classical and, and, and discrete and has a certain, say, symmetry such as some kind of swap operations. Yes. But we, poor souls that we are, when we make measurements, we actually end up in these eigenstates or irreducible representations of these symmetries and those symmetries, those places where we end up, look as if they're governed by complex numbers. Yes. Even though the whole thing overall is just possible. So we, as, as you say, as ignorant humble beings, are unable to identify what the true states of, of, of existence are. We are using phony states. The things we call atoms, the things we call fields, the things we call particles, are not the two real things that are going on as well. Okay, what I found some time ago, that's really uh, sort of mind-blowing to me, <coughs> is that all the automata I work with now are complex. Okay, and uh, it's very simple. I mean that every uh, cell is either large. Uh, there are five things, okay? Uh, tokens, I call them. Uh, there's one and minus one. There's I and minus I and zero. That's it. Okay, and there's two spaces, you know, the salt model, where some, you sort of have the chloride space and the sodium ion space. Uh, that kind of model, which is uh, a cube made up of two face center cubes. One is complex and the other One's imaginary and the other's real. And this turns out to have you know, almost magical problems. So, so you two have a different reality. Well, just a bit more positive spin on it. That, you know, conspiracy theory sounds so negative.